I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We're in this teaching series titled Short Stories. Matthew chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 21, we find different parables, different teachings of Jesus. These are short stories with big, big ideas. Short stories with big ideas. And so Matthew chapter 13, I want to invite you to turn in in your own Bible. And if you need a Bible, we have some copies of God's Word in the back uh, in our next step area. We'd love for you to take one of those Bibles. If you have glasses, it's probably like needed to read it, but uh, to read that one. But uh, the the print is like negative three, and so, uh, but, but nonetheless, there's Bibles in the back. We'd love for you to open up God's word for yourself. Matthew chapter 13, we're looking at two parables today, two bar- parables today, two short stories, it is the mustard seed and leaven, mustard seed and leaven. Adam Clark says this before we dive into verse 31 of chapter 13, both these parables are prophetic and were intended to show how from very small beginnings, the gospel of Christ should spread through all the nations of the world and fill them with righteousness and true holiness. The main idea, if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to take notes. The main idea is this, that don't overlook small beginnings. Don't overlook small beginnings. It's easy especially in the world that we live in, to overlook the small beginnings, like where you're at right now. It's easy to put yourself up against somebody else and say, man, this is where I should be. It's easy to fall victim of that, fall into that, that trap of the, of the enemy. And, and, and in doing that, what happens is we miss what God is doing right here, right now within us. It's easy to miss that. And so I would encourage you as we look to these two short stories, the scriptures today, to don't overlook the small beginnings. Don't overlook what the Lord Jesus is doing right here, right now. Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when grown, it's taller than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. So all these parables are about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is teaching the disciples and all who would hear him that day and even us this day about the kingdom of heaven. What does kingdom community really look like? And Jesus uses in this short story imagery of a mustard seed. A few years ago, I was leading a tour uh, throughout the Holy Land, and we were walking down the side of the mountain where uh, uh, somewhere in that vicinity, the Sermon of the Mount would have taken place over 2,000 years ago. And as we're walking down the side of that mountain, we're looking over the Sea of Galilee, and I'm seeing all of these yellow flowers. And finally, I walk over to the tour guide, and I ask him, what is this yellow flower? And he says, it's the mustard seed. It's the wild mustard seed flower. And it just connected with me in that moment. Jesus is using what the people would see to teach about the kingdom of heaven. And so that it would come alive to them in that moment, but also don't miss this. He knew that he would ascend into heaven one day. And what a reminder as those disciples would walk about and see those mustard seed, wild mustard seed, and be reminded about the kingdom of heaven and the encouragement to continue to live on mission. The mustard seed is is tiny, about the size of the head of a a pin. It's tiny. It's the smallest of all seeds. And the parable describes how the seed, once planted, grows into a large shrub-like tree that can actually grow over 15 feet tall. So don't miss this in the understanding and the context as we're trying to understand what is Jesus communicating to his disciples that day and to us this day. The first, I believe, is that the kingdom starts small. Write that down and consider this truth. 
that the kingdom starts small. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He points out the imagery of a, 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 of a wild mustard seed. And, and within that wild mustard seed, there, 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 there's uh, so, so, I'm not going to make up a number, but so many seeds found within that little flower. I instantly, by the way, went and grabbed as many as I could, stuck them in my bag, went back to the hotel room, uh, picked them out of that wildflower, uh, let them dry out, put them in a bag, brought them home, and they're sitting in my office uh, as a reminder of that day. But the kingdom starts small. We, we've, we've stated this, but it needs to be stated one more time that many expected the Messiah to bring the kingdom in a blaze of glory with victory over the oppressive Romans and anyone else that stood in the way. That was the hope of the Jewish people, that the Messiah that they were waiting for would bring victory, would release them from the, the rule and reign of the Romans. But God had a different idea as God and his sovereignty typically has different ideas than you and I, amen? What does he do? He sends Jesus to earth as savior that no one expected. Jesus, he was born in the tiny town of Bethlehem in poverty. He was raised in Nazareth. It was Nathaniel. Nathanael that asked the question in John chapter 1, verse 46, can anything good come from Nazareth? Jesus had no family connections. Jesus had no money. He had no support from the religious leaders of the day. Jesus was considered to be a nobody from nowhere who would amount to nothing. I don't know what you feel today. I don't know what you think about your life today. But if any of these thoughts, you are in good company. Jesus' followers were ordinary people of society. His own people rejected him. The prophet Isaiah, what did he say? He was despised and rejected by men. And the Romans eventually nailed him to a cross, and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus arrived on earth in very insignificant and ordinary circumstances. It was from this humble beginning that the kingdom of God was founded. This humble beginning that the kingdom of God was founded. God introduced his kingdom to the world in, in, in the smallest, most humble manner imaginable. And often that's how he operates. He uses the small, the humble, the vulnerable, and the weak to achieve things for his glory. And so once again, I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know what the thoughts that are going through your mind. I don't know the feelings going through your body. I don't know what your five-year plan looks like. If you even have one of those, it might be falling apart all around you. But I know this, that the kingdom started small. And we would be wise to not overlook the small beginnings. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, would you write this reference down? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 says this. Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective. Uh, that's good news for me. Not, not, not many powerful. Good news for me. Not many of noble birth. Obviously, good news for me. Verse 27, instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing, what is viewed as something. Verse 29, so that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus. It's from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us. He is our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. In order, verse 31, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. If we're going to brag, we better brag on the Lord. If we're going to be boastful, we better boast in the Lord. God uses the small and insignificant. God uses the small and insignificant. Consider Joseph's life as you Think through the Old Testament. Uh, uh, consider Joseph's life. 
he was despised by his brothers. He was despised by his brothers. He was sold into slavery by his brothers to the Egyptians. God rescued him from a prison. And what did he do? Allow him to rise to number two over all of Egypt. Consider the life of Moses, who was called by God to challenge Pharaoh. And not just challenge Pharaoh, but to secure the release of the Israelites who had lived under oppression for 400 years. And what is Moses' response? Moses himself said, who am I? I am slow of speech. Send someone else. And what does God do? He says, no, you're the man. Consider Ruth. Ruth was born in a pagan land, married to an Israelite. That man dies, stays faithful, and moves to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, then later marries Boaz and bears a son named Obed, who becomes the grandfather of David and the ancestor of Jesus. Consider David who was the youngest of eight sons. He was given the job of shepherd boy because nobody else wanted it. They thought they deserved more. And God turned David into a giant killing king. God uses the small and insignificant. The kingdom started small, but next, note this, the kingdom spreads into something great. Although it started small, it spread into something great. Jesus started his ministry with 12 followers. And these 12 followers, we've already seen, these 12 followers were not the top religious leaders of the day. These 12 followers were just ordinary people of society. Many of these 12 followers were actually despised by society. And even one of these followers whom Jesus called would betray him. But what did Jesus do? Jesus invested in his disciples. He taught them about the kingdom of God so that they could tell others and spread the gospel. Listen, church, like, like the seed that has to be buried to grow, so Jesus was buried. But from the ground, he rose to establish his kingdom on earth. His death was not the end. By the time Jesus had returned to heaven, there were about 120 followers. And at Pentecost, Peter stands before the crowd and the disciples stand behind him and he preaches this message of repentance and this message of salvation, this very bold, clear message of salvation. And 3,000 follow Jesus that day. And 2,000 years later, the kingdom continues to grow. Some suggest that there are around 2 billion Christians worldwide. It started with 12 followers of Jesus. The kingdom starts small. The kingdom spreads into something great. Jesus, as he's teaching about the mustard seed being planted, he then says in verse 32 that that seed becomes a tree. It becomes a tree. Now, the language suggests that Jesus was referring to the Old Testament use of the tree as an image for a great empire. And do your own research. Do your own study. Ezekiel chapter 31, Daniel chapter 4. Jesus is sharing that imagery in this language this day. And that seed becomes a, a tree. And then, then he says, so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. So this seed starts small. It grows into a tree. And then that tree is now a habitat for wildlife, for the birds of the sky. Now, a close study of, of birds as, as symbols in the Old Testament uh, and especially in literature of, of Judaism, shows that birds regularly symbolize evil and even demons or Satan. It's interesting what Jesus, as he's teaching about the kingdom of heaven, 
it's interesting that when we take a step back and, and really look to the context of what Jesus is teaching, what is he trying to communicate? This parable describes what the kingdom became decades after the spread of, of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. The church grew, grew great in influence. The, ch the church grew great uh, in dominion. And as it grew, sadly, it became a nest for corruption. And you might be wondering, what's the point? Like, get to the point. What's the point of all of this? And I, I, I believe that the point of all of this is the more people, the more problems. But the point of the church is people, and so there are going to be problems. But the more people, the more problems. The, the larger the church grows, the larger the church grows, the bigger it gets, the more oversight is needed. The more accountability is needed. The more transparency is needed. The more prayer is needed. The more participation is needed. The more fully devoted followers of Jesus are needed as the church grows. At 9 a.m., I, I paused at this point, and, and I believe the Lord uh, called me to pause again. As I was sharing this, it just came to my mind and my heart how important prayer is. And oftentimes we've reduced prayer to, you know, we're about to eat something, so we feel guilty if we don't say something, right? <laughs> By the way, that was never, like, never. Parents, uh, I I'd encourage you, we put our girls down to bed each night and we pray, and, and from time to time I'll pause and say, hey, did you just mean what you said? And don't look at me. And I said, why don't you just, why don't you say another prayer? <laughs> like, like from the heart, you know? And um, I, I want to I wanna plead with you for a moment. I want to plead with you to be a people of prayer. I, I want to plead with you to pray for, for me. I want to plead with you to pray for my family. I want to plead for you to pray for the other staff and their families of this church. I, I want to plead that you would pray for the people of this church, even the people that you don't yet know. I, I want to plead that, that we would be a church, uh, a, a praying people. I believe when we study history and we see all the mighty moves of God, those mighty moves came out of a praying people. They came out of a people that were committed to prayer. Why? Because the dependence was on the Lord Jesus, not on their abilities, not on their gifts, not on their assets, but on the Lord Jesus. And I want to call us to be a praying people. I want to call us to be a praying people. And I want to beg that you would pray. And I mean that with all sincerity. I mean that with all sincerity. Charles Spurgeon was once asked, what's the success what do you equate the success of the ministry to? He was asked this question. He's known as the Prince of Preachers. He was asked this question, and you know what he said? My people pray. My people pray. Would you write a note somewhere, keep it somewhere, and pray? Would you pray for us daily? Pray that we would continue to be focused on the mission that God has called us to. Pray that we would stay focused on preaching the word of God without watering it down. Pray that we would be bold witnesses. Pray that we would put on the full armor of God daily to withstand the attacks of the evil one. Would you pray? Would you pray for us? At the end of this parable, the mustard seed, and the beginning of the next one, the leaven. Tells us why Oversight is important, tells us why prayer is important, tells us why transparency is important, tells us why participation of the local church is so important. Would you look to verse 33, Matthew chapter 13? He told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. 
like a little bit of leaven that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom starts small. The kingdom spreads into something great. The kingdom stands against darkness and death. The kingdom of heaven is all about life. The kingdom of, of Satan is all about death. And this is a picture of the kingdom of God working its way through the whole world. Do you note 50 pounds of flour? That's a lot. And Jesus uses this language to prophesy, if you will, that the church is going to grow, to speak to the future, that the church is going to grow. And we better be careful of, as the church grows, that even what we talked about last week, that evil is not creeping in and filling the church with corruption. G. Campbell Morgan wrote that the leaven represents paganizing influences brought into the church. Paganizing influences brought into the church. Galatians chapter 5, would you write that reference down? Galatians 5 verse 7. Paul writes to the church in Galatia, and this is what he says, you were running well. I spent a long time since I've run. <laughs> Last time wasn't so good, you know? But uh, I don't want to receive a letter that says you were running well. I want to receive a letter that says you are running well. But this church is, <laughs> this church is receiving this letter that you were running well. Continue. Who prevented you from obeying the truth? As long as you were obeying the truth, you were running well. But you stopped obeying the truth, and guess what? You're not running well. Then he says in verse 8, this persuasion or, or, or action, this action does not come from the one who calls you. This action to not run well doesn't come from the living God. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. A little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. Why is all of this important? Paul's writing to the church in Galatia to build the church up, to remind the church to stand firm in the good fight of faith, to continue to be a witness to the world. There's good news because Christ Jesus has come and he's died and he rose again, that he's alive. And so a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. What is this message for us today. The message is simple. Be very careful who you associate with. Be very careful who you allow into your life. Be very careful into the influences that they will have upon you. And by the way, this isn't just a message for the younger generation. It's a message for all generations because we're all easily influenced. Whether you want to believe it or not, you are easily influenced. That's why there's paid influencers out there, right? Why? Because they know they can get your money. And so you better be careful. A little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. Paul's writing to the church and he's saying, you better stand firm in this good doctrine. You better know the good doctrine. And you better unite around the good doctrine. You better not water down the good doctrine. You better hold tight to the good doctrine because there's all kinds of ideas going to creep into the world. And what's the result going to be? Corruption. Corruption. And so be careful who you associate with. Be careful who you allow into your close circle. Now you might be saying, so you're, what about this being a witness to my, to my friends and to my neighbor? No, you better be that witness to your friends and to your neighbors. We see very clearly Jesus' example for the church. He spent time with the Father, but he ran to the sinners. Now, he was Jesus, and so you better be careful. You better be a prayed-up person. You better be a person in the Word of God, and you better be that living example to those that the Lord Jesus is bringing into your life to be able to speak truth into them and point them ultimately to him. He is the only answer. First. Corinthians 15.33, would you write that reference down? 1 Corinthians 15.33 says this, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. Just want to remind you of that today, bad company corrupts 
good morals. Be careful who you allow to the closest, uh, in your closest circle, and who you allow to influence. The leaven soon began its corrupting influence in the church, and it continues in one form or another, working still today. Look to verse 34. Matthew chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables, and he did not tell them anything without a parable, so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Here's the prophet. Psalm 78. I will open my mouth in parables. I will declare things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Verse 34 describes this particular season of Jesus' ministry in the context of the increasing opposition from the Jewish leaders of the day. Now, if you've been on this journey with us through Matthew, you've seen the tension after tension after tension, the conflict uh, between Jesus and his, his disciples and, and the religious leaders of the day. They're watching for him. They're watching for him to do something that is against the law. They're trying to call him out. They're, they're, they're you know, there's constant tension throughout the gospel of Matthew between the religious leaders of the day and Jesus and his disciples. And it's only getting worse. It's only, it's only growing. And in verse 35, Jesus taught about the kingdom and parables because the church itself was part of the things which have been kept secret from the foundations of the world and would not be revealed in fullness until later. Do you see that in verse 35? I will declare things kept secret from the foundation of the world. I will declare things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 gives us a little insight of what is Jesus referring to? And, and what is this text in Psalm 78 referring to? Ephesians chapter 3, verse, verse 4, <clears throat> says, By reading this, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. This was not made known to people in other generations. Do you see that? As it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets, by the Spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Verse 7, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace. Do you see that? Paul recognizes that he is only a servant by God's grace. You and I would do well to recognize that we are only a servant of God by his grace. That has given to me by the working of his power. By the grace of God and his power at work, we are his servant. Verse 8, this grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim, that is to, to preach, to announce the good news to the Gentiles, the incalculable riches of Christ, and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things. Don't miss verse 10. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now, do you hear this? May now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. But the mystery is no longer a mystery. It's no longer hidden. The church is alive and well. The church is to live on mission for the Lord Jesus. We are called to be his witnesses. We are called to make disciples that make disciples. That it's no longer a mystery. It's no longer a secret. Jesus has come. He died. And he rose from the grave victorious. You might be thinking again. I just don't know what I have to offer. My health maybe isn't what it used to be. Maybe on the other end of the spectrum, I'm, I'm just too young. You, you, you might be thinking, you, you don't know my life, you don't know my home, you don't know. But can I just encourage you today? Oh, 
what the Lord can accomplish in and through the life of a surrendered follower of his. Oh, what the Lord can accomplish in and through your life, my life, one who is surrendered wholly to him. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10 has been one of those verses that has stuck with me over the years. And the CSB reads, For who despises the day of small things? Listen to the New Living Translation. Clearly, do not despise these small beginnings. You might be overlooking the small beginnings. You might be overlooking what God is doing right now as you're looking ahead of of, of where you want to be. But don't overlook the right now. Don't overlook the people that God has placed in your life right now. Don't waste another moment. Twenty-five years ago, 25 years ago, I was given an opportunity. If you've been with the church long enough, you've heard this. So I'm sorry to hear it one more time. But, but I'm telling you, it's more alive today than it, than, it, than it has been in a long time. 25 years ago, my youth pastor walked up to me and he said, you want to preach one of these next chapels? I went to a Christian academy and and I instantly said, no. Man, I, I wanted the pursuits of the world. I wanted the popularity. I wanted all these things. And I just instantly thought, if I stood before 300 of my peers, what would they think of me? I walked away from telling him no, and two weeks, two weeks went by, and day after day, it was like torture. The Spirit of God was so moving within me and calling me, I went back to him. I went back to him and I said, yes. I answered the call 25 years ago by just saying, yes. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. I went home and my dad helped me craft this message. I practiced it. Felt like 73 times in front of a mirror in the bathroom. Timed it 31 minutes. I got out there, and in six and a half minutes, it was over. <laughs> I, walked off the, I walked off the stage, and I said, God, I don't know if any of that made sense. I don't even know what I said. I am scared to death, but I'm more alive than I've ever been. And I'll tell you, I am so thankful. I said yes 25 years ago. Had I not said yes, I don't believe I would be here today. Having witnessed all that the Lord has done over this ministry over 15 years, I just wonder how the Lord is moving in your life today. I just wonder for those that are online, how the Lord is moving in your life today. I wonder how the Lord is stirring and calling you into his ministry today. I wonder what passion the Lord has given you that's just sitting on the sideline saying someone else will go. I wonder for the even the younger generation, I, I, I wonder how many pastors are among us that the Lord might be calling up. I, I wonder for the people of the church how many missionaries, vocational missionaries might be among us that God is calling to the nations. I, I wonder how many are missing out on real purpose. Spurgeon once said, Every Christian is an, either an imposter or a missionary. And, and I wonder today if there's some imposters among us that the Lord's calling you, He's stirring within you, and you can no longer say no, but it's yes. I wonder if you'll answer the call. 
If you'll answer his call today by saying yes. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place, those that are online with us? Would you do the same? And I want to invite you to take just a moment. Take a moment. To, don't, don't think about the rest of this day or next week. Don't talk to the person next to you. L limit all distractions. Limit all distractions. And just for a moment, would you get alone with the Lord? Would you just get alone with him and just say, here's my life. Here's my life. I say yes, whatever it is. Whatever it is, I say yes to you. Would you do that? As the Spirit of God moves, would you say yes to him? As people are praying all across this place, I wonder if there's one here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus for salvation. Can I tell you, that's the starting place. That's where it all starts. It's hard to say yes to the mission of God before you receive the message of God. And so perhaps there's one here, either in the house or online, that you've never said yes to the gift of salvation. And today would be the day that you personally realize that you're a sinner, that Jesus is the Savior. You confess that he is Lord of your life. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead so that you will be saved. If that's your prayer today, as people are praying all across this place, something like this. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. And today I understand you are the Savior. I can't save myself. And I received the, your gift of salvation. Forgive me of all my sins. Today I place my hope, faith in you. I trust in you completely. I believe in you. Here's my life. Use me for your glory. I wonder if there's anyone in the house today that would answer the call by saying yes to the Lord Jesus today. If that's you, would you have the courage just to stand where you're at? Just stand where you're at. Stand up from your seat and Say yes to the Lord today. Here's my yes, Lord. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll say whatever you want me to say. Here's my yes. If that's you, would you have the courage in the house to stand right where you're sitting? Would you have the courage to stand? Amen. 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 Here's my yes, Lord. Here's my yes, Lord. Anyone else? You have the courage to stand. Here's my yes, Lord. Amen. Here's my yes, Lord. Here's my yes, Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you for the courage of those standing. Lord, thank you for the, how you're moving in the life of your people. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that empowers us, calls us. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to, to us, to your people. You would show us how we're to live our lives. Show us the areas that we can't see that are holding us back. Living for you. So Lord, thank you for the courage of those standing here today. May we be a faithful people to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. We pray. Would everyone else stand to their feet? And would you respond today as the Spirit of God leads you to respond? However the Lord is moving in your life, there's men and women in the house that would love to pray with you. If you're going through something, you feel like a burden is on you, would you allow a brother or sister to pray for you this morning as we sing this song? Would you have courage to step out of the seat and move forward as the Spirit of God leads you to move? What is your next step today? Would you trust God? Would you trust Him?